we'll try to to stay on, on time and uh if you have uh, more questions uh, that cannot fit in this uh, five minutes, I just remind you that there is uh, this uh, meet uh, the speaker session afterwards uh, where you can ask uh, more questions. So I would ask all the participants to uh, shut down the microphone unless you are the speaker. And at the end, if you have questions like yesterday, please uh, raise your hand. OK, and I'll, I'll give you the, the stage. Uh, if for some reason you cannot uh, talk, the microphone doesn't work, and so on, you can uh, you can use also the chat, and I'll uh, I'll read your questions. But uh, I think it's it's uh, better if uh, if you ask your question yourself, it would be probably clearer. Okay, so let's uh, let's start. So the first speaker is Axel Schild from uh, Zurich, and he will talk about mini electron effects of strong filarization described in an exact one electron theory. So please, Axel. Thank you, Nicola, uh, and also thank you, thank the organizers for this opportunity to talk here. Uh, I really like this online conference, actually. So I hope you can see me and hear me well. If not, please let me know. Yeah, so I thought I'm going to start with something that you should, that most of you already know, and this is the three-step model. Now, the three-step model is kind of a very fundamental model in atom science, and um, it's the standard model that you have some kind of a, um, well, you have a laser field, which induces some kind of ionization by tilting the, the potential. So this is kind of a, let's say an atomic potential or something like that. And here you have some kind of electron cloud and there's a laser field coming and this, and this tunnel ionization happens where an electron is ionized. And in its ne next step, you have this uh, continuum propagation where your tunneled electron, your free electron, is now moving outside of this core region um, and is only influenced by the laser field. And then when the, when the field sign changes, the electron is accelerated backwards and is then hitting the parent ion, the core, I call it core. Um, and this leads, in this case, to the generation of high harmonics. Yeah. It's one of the standard models in um, natural science. Now, let's say you really want to simulate this. Now, a lot of you do this, and you know this prob the problem. And the fundamental problem is that this region here is actually not just one electron, it's many electrons. So you have to simulate many electrons, which in principle is possible for uh, in, in a bound state region, of course, there are many methods for that. But at the same time, you also have to simulate this ionized part, which can move very far away. And so you also have to cover a very large spatial region. And you might also have to very low amplitude here, so very small um, amount of electrons there. So you somehow have to describe this together. And this is kind of a big challenge in the field, which a lot of people work on. Now, what about this? So if we really want to look at this picture, yeah, this is kind of a single electron picture. And also many calculations or many yeah, models are, are based on such a single electron picture. I call it the single active electron assumption, where you're saying you have a wave function of one electron. And this is now propagated in, the, in, a, in an effective potential with some additional interaction with the laser field. Now here in, the length gauge and the dipole approximation can also be different. But the main point here is that you have this, this kind of one electron potential. Um, and you want to use this to describe or to somehow simulate your system. Now, if you look at this, you may ask yourself, well, what is this potential? Where do I get this from? Now, for atoms, we kind of know what's relevant and we can, uh, we can guess or come up with a sensible potential. But now if you say you want to do it for a molecule, and of course it's a, it's a bit more of a challenge. And then what's also often, often the problem or what is considered a problem in this kind of approach is that you do not really include the many electron effects, at least not the time dependent many electron effects. Now in this talk, I would like to show you a method which can actually do this in principle at least. And this is the so-called exact electron factorization. And what happened here is that I replaced this potential, which I had before, you know, by a 
general time dependent potential. And what I'm claiming, what I want to convince you of is that this exact electron factorization is a method to map the many electron problem in principle exactly to a one electron problem. And it's a method which gives you immediately the equations to calculate this V of R and T, so to calculate the effective potential. And also one of the goals of this talk is to show you how this one electron potential looks like if you really have many electrons that we want that we are describing. Now the content of the presentation is I'm first going to go through the idea of this exact electron factorization and some intuitive picture. I'm also quickly going to relate this to density functional theory and to this von Oppenheimer picture. Um, also you will see why. Then I'm talking a little bit about the peculiarities of the exact electron factorization because it's a special theory and we have some interesting um, properties of the theory that might be surprising for you. Then I will show you this, this some an example of such a one electron potential of a many electron dynamics. And I will show you that it's pretty ugly, but I will also show you what's important there and how to make it pretty. And in the end, I'm also going to give you an idea of how we want to really use this ansatz of this idea of this exact electron factorization to simulate a proper many electron dynamics. So the exact electron factorization, what is it? And to explain you what it is, I've made this little picture here. So this is just a this is just uh, should, should be the many electron um, time dependent Schrodinger equation, where we have some external potential, which is made by the nuclei, and we have some electron electron interaction. And of course, there's have some time dependence here because we want to have some laser field, laser field interaction. Now this picture should be such a molecule. And here, these red stars should be two nuclei. And then we have uh, the yellow stars, which are the five electrons. Now, it's not a very realistic system, but I think you get the idea. Um, we're also working, as I'm always working now in the Bonoppenheim approximation, which means this nuclei are, are fixed, they're clamped nuclei. Yeah? And now the idea is that we write our many electron wave function as such a product. And this is a product of a one electron wave function and the product of an n minus one electron wave function, which describes the environment. So I'm coloring one of these electrons blue here. I'm saying this is the electron that I want to look at. And all the other electrons now constitute the environment for this one electron. And the chi is the wave function of this one electron, and the phi is the wave function of all the other electrons. Now, mathematically, we are doing this by um, by this well-known uh, way of writing a joint probability density as a product of a marginal and a conditional probability density. So what we're saying is we have this product, that's the many electron wave function is this one electron wave function times this n minus one electron wave function. And we're now requiring the absolute square of the one electron wave function to be the exact one electron density. So we're integrating over all but the coordinates of one electron. This means the square is the exact one electron density. Now, we don't know the phase. I'll come back to this later. But as long as we uh, make our theory correct and we compute all the observables correctly, uh, this will not be a problem. And we will have, uh, we will have a phase also for this wave function. And then, by this ansatz in principle, we can just define the um, this wave function of the environment, so of the n minus one electrons. And in this case, um, it is a conditional probability. And so the absolute square is the conditional probability density. The function itself is a conditional probability amplitude, which tells you the probability of where these n minus one electrons are given an electron is at a certain position. So it's like, it's really like a time parameter. So it's also like, a, or like given my time is this, given my nuclei are there, given one electron is at a certain position, what do the other electrons do? You know? This is also why this is normalized 
with respect to all the other electrons, but there's one electron which is an additional parameter, and of course our usual time parameter. Now the important thing here is that if we do this, we will find that this, if our total wave function obeys a time-dependent Schrodinger equation, or some Schrodinger equation, um, also the chi, so our one electron wave function, will obey a Schrodinger equation. And it's also one, it's, in this case, it's really a one electron Schrodinger equation, and you can, in principle, get all sensible one electron observables of the many electron system by just solving this one electron Schrodinger equation. And all the other electrons essentially appear just as potentials in this one electron Schrodinger equation. Now, that's the equation it's for one electron. And uh, I've, I've written explicitly these different contributions to, the, to this one electron potential. I'm not giving you the formulas here. I'm only going to show you this some kind of intuitive picture of how they, of what they are. So the first one is the first contribution to that our blue electron here feels is the external potential. That's the interaction with the nuclei or with the laser field. Yeah. Now there's a second contribution, and this is the energy of the n minus one electron system. Now in this case, it's the it's a four electron system. And you can imagine now if I move this, this blue electron along from here to there to there, then the configuration of the other four electrons can change. Yeah, it can be a, like there can be an energetically better state. So in this sense, the energy of these four electrons also changes depending on where the where my blue electron is. And this is this uh, this part of the potential, the H. Then we also have another part, which we call the geometric potential for certain reasons. Um, this is an additional potential, which uh, comes from the fact that there's some kind of rearrangement happening. So if I move along from here to there, at some point, these electrons will change or may change their position. And there's some additional energy needed to do this. And this is what the geometric potential essentially re represents. And then we also have uh, two gauge dependent parts. The gauge will be explained in the next, in this next slide. And um, there's a vector potential here, which is essentially related to the relative motion of this one electron with respect to the other electrons. And then there is a scalar gauge dependent part, which is in some sense related to the relative motion of this electron with respect to some uh, external clock that uh, gives you the time parameter. So these are the different contributions. Um, and I told you that the last two, this, this vector potential and this gauge dependent part are gauge dependent. Now, what is the gauge? Well, the gauge is exactly that I, we, we have not specified um, the phase of this one electron wave function. But of course we need this. I mean, to, to calculate observables in principle, we need this but it's a gauge freedom. So we can choose any phase because this product is, so the product does not depend on this phase. So if I add a phase factor here, there should be an I here, and an I here, because S is real valued. So if I add a phase factor here and just the opposite of this phase factor over there, the product doesn't change. So this S is a completely, it's a free, free uh, variable. All that changes is that we have to replace our gauge dependent potential by a new potential which depends on the time derivative of the S and the vector potential by a potential that uh, where we add the, the gradient uh, of the S. Otherwise, all equations in the theory stay the same. The important thing is also that we have to uh, be careful to define all observables that we want to calculate. So the momentum or the kinetic energy, they have to be gauge invariant. So they have to be defined properly. Um, yeah, in this gauge, I mean, you're probably familiar with it. It's the same that you're having in um, electrodynamics. Now, from, from now on, or at least from two slides onwards, I will use the gauge where the vector potential is zero. 
that's not always possible in general in rotating systems it's not it can be fairy phrases as maybe something related to spin all this kind of fancy stuff uh, which i'm not going to talk about so i don't know much about it at the moment but um just for you to know in principle this gate is not always possible and the like the potential that i'm going to ignore from now on in general has to be taken into account so now i hope that I've at least pictorially convinced you that there is this one electron um, Schrodinger equation with all this one electron potentials, which is in principle an exact one electron theory of the many electron problem, at least if we know this potentials. These potentials are given by the wave function of the environment. Now, one important point that I just want to make, because there is this, I colored this electron blue, so it looks like a special electron now, but it's not. I mean, the electrons are indistinguishable. Uh, because we start from a fully anti-symmetrized wave function, so there is no, uh, there is, at least as long as we don't make any approximation, there is, we do not break the anti-symmetry of the full problem. No. Now, I promised you to tell you something about the relation to density functional theory, and here it is, it's just one slide. The difference is, it's now a static picture. The difference is so in density functional theory, you're having your one electron density, and you compute this as a sum, as a sum over Koncham of the absolute square of Koncham orbitals, um, where these Koncham orbitals are different eigenfunctions of the Koncham potential. So here I'm in this dot, this dashed line is the external potential for some model. Um, and this solid line here is the Koncham potential. You have the two states, and this gives you some density. Yeah? So this is now based on this fictitious Koncham system of non-interacting electrons. We have some efficient approximations, but you know we have, in principle, some unknown functional dependency of the energy on the density. Now, in this exact electron factorization, what we're doing is different. This is actually the density that or the, the wave function that corresponds to the density that we also get if we add these two. You know? But now, at least in the sort of, if we do not include any time, then uh, the exact electron factorization will give you one potential, that's this potential here, and the density will correspond to the ground state of this potential. You know? So the good thing here is that um, we have explicitly non functional dependencies. But also the, the interpretation is very different from what you're used to be, what you're used to. Just as a side remark, um, uh, if you do not include time and do not care about the vector potentials and about this uh, interpretation of conditional wave functions, um, there's also orbital free density functional theory, which is in principle based on the same potential, we're just using a different formalism. Now, one more remark, because I will leave this later, is that there is this relation to von Oppenheim. And now, those of you who know the exact factorization uh, know this already. So here we had the many electron wave function. This is product of one electron wave function and this conditional n minus one electron wave function. But formally, it's the same, like if we would say that we have a wave function which depends on nuclear and electronic coordinates. And we write this as a product of the wave function for the nuclei only, and one for the electrons, which conditionally depends on the position of the nuclei. And this is now the exact version of what you usually would do in the von oppenheimer approximation, where you say you have a wave function of nuclei and electrons, which is a wave function of the nuclei only. And then you have a wave function of the electrons where you have, which is for each different position of the nuclear. Yeah. Now, this correspondence, I will use it once later. Um, it's just for you to, to know where it comes from. Now, of course, we are working in a, in a very different regime because we're only working with electrons. It's all anti-symmetric. And also what's important here is that our one electron and this n minus one electron environment, so excitations in these two parts are on the same energy scale, which is why we cannot do something like a, Born Oppenheimer approximation. It's not quite true. It's sometimes we can do, but in general we cannot. Yeah. So um, it's uh, it's related, but it's also it's also different. 
So now there are some of the peculiarities of the exact electron factorization that I, I want to show you and that you will also see later when I'm going to show you this exact um, potential, this exact one electron potential for the many electron problem. Now the first peculiarity is that our potential can have steps. And this is, this is known from density functional theory and also from time dependent density functional theory. They also have steps. It's related to our steps, very closely related. Um, and these kind of steps um, are somehow, at least they are somehow rel relevant for ionization. So, and I think I just want to, to um, quickly give you some insight into what causes this step in this potential. So now our, I'm having a system here where I have one nucleus here with charge plus two, one nucleus here with charge plus one, and we have two electrons, same spin, so the wave function is anti-symmetric. Now our one electron potential for this system would be the sum of these three potentials. So the sum of the external potential where we have our nucleus, one nucleus here, the other nucleus there. Then we have our average system of this environment and we have the geometric potential. Now, just to, to show you, so this, this geometric potential always happens, uh, it, it's, it's relevant whenever there is a change in the environment. You know? And down here, you see the wave function of the environment. You have to imagine this as a one electron wave function, which is going in this direction. So this X2 is the coordinate of the one electron. And X1 is your conditional coordinate. So it's the position of the other electron. Depending on where it is, the wave function of this environment will look differently. So in this region, we are having a wave function which is localized on one side, on one nucleus, actually on the nucleus of charge plus two. In this region, we have um, a different state where the other electron the environment is localized on the nucleus of charge plus one. And here it's going back to plus two. You know. And there is some change in this wave function here, which makes this bump here. And there's also a pretty small bump there, which is because this change happens over a larger region. Now that's what, what, what I really want to point out here is this, this step feature. And this step feature is essentially this change of the energy of the environment, the change of the energy of this electron number two from this state to this state and then back. Um, so I think, I think maybe it's, it's easier to, to explain it with this picture. Imagine you have your, so imagine you have this one electron that you want to describe and you say it's somewhere coming from the right and it's somewhere localized at this position. Yeah, that's the nucleus of charge plus one. Now the other electron will certainly be at the nucleus of charge plus two. Yeah? So this electron feels an energy which corresponds to the energy of this kind of environment state. But now if we move this electron over there, the other electron will certainly not be in this region or be in the other region. Yeah. So we have this kind of more or less sudden change from, from this position to this position, which effectively changes the energy that this electron sees. sees. Then if we move it out again, this electron will at some point fall back and the energy that this electron sees will again be different. That's the reason or the origin of this step. And as I said, it's kind of related to ionization because if you imagine one electron going out, this electron going out, then um, depending on what's happening in this region, um, some kind of rearrangement, the energy that this electron feels may be different. So there can be some steps happening in the potential and there will be, I'll show you, there will be steps. The second peculiarity for this kind of, for this uh, explanation, I'm, I'm using this corresponds to the von Oppenheimer case because it's easier to show here in the von Oppenheimer case. Um, in this case, I'm looking, we're looking at a model where we have two nuclei. This is a fixed nucleus. And here we have a moving nucleus and a moving electron. And the potential is such that uh, it's symmetric. So there's a minimum here and there's an equal minimum over there. Now, if you look at the von Oppenheimer state of this problem, 
for the nucleus, for this nucleus, essentially you will see some kind of double well potential where the ground state is this plus plus state and the first excited state is this plus minus state. And you have this kind of tunneling doublet. Now, if you um, do the exact factorization on that, you will see that each of these states of the total system corresponds to different potentials. So the blue potential is again the potential of the ground state, which looks like the von Oppenheimer potential. Um, the wave function also looks like looks like the von Oppenheimer potential uh, wave function. But the first excited state actually it is never reaching zero. So there is no sign change here, not really, except if you change the gauge. You can do that, but in general, there's no sign change if you want a continuous wave function. However, this potential will have a large spike at this region. So it will be the same potential like the ground state, it will just have a large spike. And now you can imagine the von Oppenheimer cases, if you have a very, very large spike, this all goes to zero, you can just shift, you can just remove the spike, change the sign here, and then you get to the left picture. You know? Now, what I want you to take away from this is that for our exact electron factorization, there are two important points. The first one is that in principle, every state of this n electron system corresponds to an individual potential for the one electron system. And also, when this one electron density becomes small, there can be a spike in the potential. It doesn't have to be, but there can be. And this spike is related to this fact that we cannot change, that our wave function actually never really becomes zero, so we do not have nodes. We cannot really change the sign of the wave function. OK. so. Uh, now, let me show you the potential. And I told you it's ugly. Um, now it's for a very simple model. Um, the model is just one atom. You have one nucleus and you have two electrons. Again, it's important this, these are same spin electrons. Um, so you have an anti symmetric wave function. And um, what I'm not going to show you is or what I would like to, to focus on is this green curve here. So on the on this top left, you see the, the logarithm of the density, so that you know where this where the electron actually is, the one electron density. Down here in green, you see the exact one electron potential for this two electron dynamics. And over there, you see some you see essentially this this region, just a larger larger part of this region. And up here, you will see the laser flux. Now, so this is um, what I'm showing you now. And now, if you if you go along the laser field, look at the green potential, you will see it's happening. So you're seeing this kind of spikes appearing here. And then you're also seeing this kind of drastic steps appearing. Yeah. So it's really not a not such a beautiful potential. And what you're also noticing is that there's some kind of time dependence going on here in this, in this region. Now, first, this types spikes and steps, the things that make this potential rather ugly. Um, so these features also occur in time dependent density functional theory. And the steps in, the, in our case are actually um, for the atom, at least they're only in the gauge dependent part of the potential. Um, and so far we have, we've just ignored that. So they're kind of, in some sense, uh, they kind of indicate some kind of rearrangement in the, in the core, which changes the, the, the density of your outgoing electron a little bit. Um, but it's always at positions where the where there is a very small probability of finding the electron anyway. So we we just um, ignored the steps so far. The spikes, the spikes, they actually prevent the wave function from having a node. 
And the trick is that we just say, well, our wave function may have a node. It's just like a node, like what we usually expect. And then we just ignore the spikes. Uh, and this is the, um, so we, I would say that the spikes and the steps are not so relevant, at least the, the steps outside this region, outside the, the core region. Now there's also, but what I what you might have also seen is that there is this time dependent ionization barrier. So this is now the core region, and you have to your electron is ionizing from here somewhere out. And this is just shown for one snapshot. And this is really a, some this, this barrier is really drastically dependent on your laser field parameters. So especially on the central frequency, the higher the frequency, the less important or the less time dependent is, it is. Um, but for low frequencies, um, there can be a very, very strong effect here. And this is, of course, something that you really have to include because um, if you want to describe tunnel ionization, for example, well, you have the barrier through which you're tunneling is very, very important. So um, you need to somehow include this effect. Now, getting rid of this, um, Spikes and steps, it's actually easy. So we can make the potential pretty. And we can do this by using this, what we call this time independent conditional amplitude approximation. Approximation is just that um, we're, we're not having any time dependence in our exact electron factorization potential. The only time dependence is in the laser field. And we can also have a time, uh, and we also do not assume that the dipole is time dependent or some kind of effective dipole is time dependent. Now, the, the underlying idea here is that if you're moving your electron out, there will be some um, response of the other electrons to this. Um, and we're assuming that this potential that the electron sees when it moves out is independent of whether the laser field is there or not. And this is the essence of this approximation. Um, it can be calculated, principle for molecules. It has no spikes, it has no steps. It's the red line here compared to the blue line, which is the exact case. But the problem is that it does not have this time dependent barrier, which we sometimes need. Now, when do we, so when can we actually use this approximation? Well, we looked at it for, for a model system. So this is the, what you're seeing here is the laser field parameters. So this is the laser field. Um, you have some central frequency omega and you have some field strength here. And here's also the gamma parameter. And um, you see that this approximation works rather well if you have rather large frequencies, so pretty large frequencies actually. Um, but if you, if you go and uh, also for small frequencies, but very low field strengths, but for larger field strengths and small frequencies, it's rather bad. And what, I've, what we've plotted here is actually the number of electronic states that you need. Because this t approximation is kind of the idea that you only need one bound state here in this region. And otherwise, you're just doing some kind of a continuum propagation. Well, you can see here that especially if you're, if you're going into this region, this kind of uh, very relevant experimental region, um, you need typically many, many bound states to describe this dynamics correctly. So you would need, um, you, you cannot really get this uh, time dependent ionization barrier, which is related to these excitations of this parent ion. Yeah, so now that we've learned this, how can we simulate something based on this excitation factorization? And um, yeah, that's. That's the idea again. We have our, we want to simulate this somehow in a one electron picture, but we learned now that um, we in general need to describe this effective barrier here. And to describe this effective barrier, we would need um, quite some excitations in this bound state region. So our idea, which we're trying at the moment is the following. We, want to describe these two regions differently. So we want to have some kind of couple dynamics because we know in principle how to describe this core region time dependently with the many electrons in a reasonably good way. A minute, Excel. 
Yes, I'm almost done, almost done, thank you. Um, so we would like to do this with some kind of a full electron code, um, describe this. Then from this description of the core region, we want to get the potential in this region. And we want to match this with analytical form, with a kind of analytically known form of the exact electron factorization potential out there. And then our plan is to do uh, one electron propagation um, on this potential, which we get in this way. And in this way, we would like to avoid the problem of describing both the bound states and we want to essentially solve the problem of uh, coupling these bound states together with this continuum propagation. Yeah, that's what's currently underway. Uh, we call this the multi-level approximation. And now to summarize, um, I hope that I've shown you that um, the many electron problem can exactly be met to a one electron problem. That this one electron potential is spiky and has a few steps, but we can comb it. And we can also remove the steps. Um, but we need to model these excitations of the parent ion for this exact electron factorization to be useful. And now in the future, we just want to implement this um, and test it a little bit. And then there are many, many open questions like how do we treat quantum nuclei? How do we get a better feeling for the vector potential or the gauge dependent part? Or how, for example, also related to yesterday's talk, how we um, can connect the theory to the reduced density matrix formalism. Yeah, and with this, I would like to thank, or I would like to stop, and um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you, Axel, for the talk. Um, so now we have a few minutes for questions. So please raise your hand if you have any questions. Uh, okay, Eva, and then Graham. So Eva, let's start. You can, uh, you can ask your question. Thank you very much for your nice talk. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, uh, a technical question, I was wondering mm -hmm. when your potentials have uh, uh, these spikes and steps, how challenging is it for your numerical approaches? So what do you use for spatial discretization and time propagations? Yes, um, we're not doing this yet. So the, what, what I'm showing you um, in these potentials is actually the, we solve the full problem and we calculate the potentials. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the numerical solution of um, a wave function on this potential is really challenging because you, I mean, you really have to get the step right correctly because you really cannot allow it to be zero. Um, so it's, uh, we, we've, we haven't succeeded with this yet. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, yeah, we, what we are currently, uh, what, we, what we have tried is to remove the steps and the spikes and to make a propagation on this potential. Um, but we cannot um, numerically do this propagation on the real potential. No. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Gran, your turn. We cannot hear you, Gran. Can you hear me now? Yes, ah. now we can, kind of. Mm -hmm. No, not. Okay, so Graham, if you're not, maybe we can take the next question and then come back to you afterwards. So Akan or Akan Portman. And um, thank you. And thank you for your talk. Um, I just maybe have just a fundamental or stupid question. Um, you you asked uh, or you said that your um, that your wave function is actually exact um, in terms of uh, dis indistinguishability and anti-symmetry. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you could go back to slide number eight, maybe uh, um, there we where you presented your exact electron factorization. Here we see that you um, can split off just a single factor. And now let's, for example, just in, figure that we had two electrons. So therefore, on one side of the equation, you would have kind of Slater determinant or an explicitly uh, anti-correlated or anti-symmetric wave function. And on the other side, you would just have a Hartree product with no anti-symmetry at all. How is this, uh, where this, how can we solve this uh, contradiction? I don't um, see it right now. Uh, it's, so so this, the left side is right, the right side is not. Uh, so we do not have a Hartree product. Um, 
the the anti-symmetry is there in the product. I mean, it's just uh, so. So if, um, for example, if if we um, uh, okay, it's, it's uh, so so it's it's really there in the product. You just you just write your full wave function down here. You just compute the one electron density, takes the square root, then you have the the magnitude of chi. Mm -hmm. You choose your phase, and then you just say phi is psi over chi. You know? so it's okay. the thing is it's it's in the product, but it's only in the product. And that's the, that's the that's the thing. So we do not have in in the in the ansatz itself. Um, but only in this product. But formally, it's all there. It's just it's just hidden. So we cannot. I mean, from the potential, you cannot. From, from this potential, for example, yeah, you cannot. From the, from the green one, you cannot see that it corresponds to an anti-symmetric state of the full problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Yeah. Thank um, you. Graham, can you try again? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Ah. Good. Yeah, I, as always, don't know why that wasn't working. Okay. Yeah. So Axel, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, it's it's, an, it's a very nice idea actually. I like this. Um, the one question I have is that uh, so in the exact factorization, which I obviously know better from the you know the usual nuclear electronic separation, you mm -hmm. end up that the um, the coupling potential, that the gauge potential, has the sort of the one over the density term affecting the electrons, which leads to the you know, sort of problems where the density of the nuclei go to zero for the electronic wave function, yeah? Do you have sort of similar problems? Is this what's giving you the spikes? Because wherever you get a node in the probability for your many electron part, you're gonna get a spike in the potential? Um, it's, yeah, of course. I mean, you can just, you can write all the terms essentially. So all the terms of the potential is something divided by the density. Yeah, yeah. But the one electron density, whenever the one electron density becomes zero, you get something, uh, Large, that's correct. But the difference, or I mean, we so for bound states, typically this one electron density is not really. I mean, now nah, it can it can happen. Yeah, it can happen that you have some spikes, or at least some some. It's not so sharp features in this case. Because thing is, is if you have a, a true spike, you can just ignore it and just say you change the phase. So you just uh, prop, you remove the spike. The only difference is that your wave function then can go through zero and change sign. Mm -hmm. And you can just ignore it, right? Sharp spikes are no problem. The problem is spikes which are not really sharp, <laughs> so okay. which are there but which are not not so sharp. And then you have a uh, problem. Um, otherwise, we just re we we just remove the spikes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But it's different because we do not solve the problem. We don't want to solve it in a coupled way, at least not in the same way like it's done in the atom nuclear case. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. You just take that more as an average potential that it's working in. Yeah, mm, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Elke, can you just make it super short so we have like a, a minute and then we move on? Um, well, exactly the slide that you're showing there, and mm -hmm. you have the idea that you are um, building your, let's say, effective potential for the, let's say, core or atom region, and then you pluck the um, analytical uh, function that you get from the pulse, um, if I understood you correctly. But what are you planning to do with the interface region between the two? Because either you would have to go very big with the, the description of your core part, or you will have an interface region where you don't really know or where you will get inaccurate with your description. Yes, yeah, I mean, sure. So, so the initial, so the thing is, I mean, for the initial potential, we, we can get, yeah, we can get the initial potentials, especially like in the, or there are tricks, but we haven't really haven't done it yet. Okay. <laughs> in, 3, in 3D, I mean, I've done it for, for DFD and this kind of, yeah. Um, you can just by divide, I mean, just by, if you know the density, the atron density, reasonably accurately, you can get the initial potential, you know. Um, the asymptotic region is a bit tricky. You have to be careful there, um, but in principle, it can be done. And then the idea is really just to to, to change this this part. Yeah. Of course, you have to get a reasonably good um, get, get, a, get a reasonably good description up to this asymptotic part. But it's not it's not so large. At least it looks not so large so far. But I mean. We're testing. We're starting to test, <laughs> test this. So okay. I can tell you more maybe next time. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Axel, uh, for the talk and the question session. So I think we'll move to the next uh, uh, speaker. Thanks, Axel. Thank you very much. So, Vincent, are you here? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear okay, me? Can you share your, yeah. We can see you and hear you. Can you share your screen? Yeah. Please? Okay. I'm sharing my screen now. Can you see my presentation? Perfect. Okay. So the, the, okay. the next speaker is uh, Vincent from uh, Madrid and he will uh, present the scheme code and some uh, application to it. So please. Okay. Perfect. So please let me know if you can't hear me. Uh, okay. So I will start. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to be here talking. As you can see in the title, I will be talking about the ISCHEM code and the new implementation to compute photoelectron angular distributions. So why to include photoelectron angular distributions in our code? But well, nowadays, in some experiments, it is possible to detect the direction of ejection of the photoelectron photo during ionization. As an example, we see here a rabbit experiment published in Science in 2018 in, uh, for carbon monoxide molecule, and they are able to distinguish the angle between the molecular axis and the laser polarization axis. At the same time, they are able to detect the direction of ejection of the photoelectron. So if you want to describe that theoretically, you need to include uh, photoelectron angular distributions in your code. So that's why we wanted to include them in our code. Sorry. So here is the outline of the talk. First of all, I will be talking about the ISCHEM code, the theory behind the code, and I will also show briefly some of the results the ISCHEM code has produced. Then I will move to talk about the new implementation that includes photoelectron photo angular distributions, and I will show uh, the results I obtained with the carbon monoxide, still unpublished, and also the results of the piracin that a colleague of mine, Pedro, has obtained too. So I will start with the scheme code. Sorry. Here, you can see the people who started with the scheme code around five years ago. At that time, all of them were in the University Autonoma of Madrid, but as you can see, some of them has moved. Fernando Martin and Jesus Gonzalez are my PhD supervisors. And at the end of 2018, I did an internship in the University of Central Florida with the supervision of Luca Argenti. So as you can imagine, my PhD thesis is very related to the ISCHEM code. Also, something can interest you is that soon the ISCHEM code will be open source. So probably you would like to, to test it and to do some calculations. The ISCHEM code uh, is able to describe single ionization. And for describing photoionization in molecules, you need to be able to describe bound states and continuum states. For describing bound states, uh, Gaussian basis functions have shown uh, that are appropriate. They have been used during decades and they are implemented in most of quantum chemistry packages because uh, computing the electronic integrals between Gaussians defined at different centers is fast. The problem with Gaussians is that when you try to reproduce the oscillatory behavior of the photoelectron in the continuum, they build up a lot of linear dependencies. In contrast, these planes, they are really good for describing this oscillatory behavior. They also produce sparse matrices, but the problem if you try to describe bound state with these planes is that for com the computation of the electronic integrals of these planes defined at different centers are very expensive. So what the ISCAM code does is to benefit from both of them and construct what we call a GAPS hybrid uh, basis, that these are Gaussian and Bisplan basis. This GAPS basis is constructed with polycentric Gaussians centered at the atomic positions, as you can see in this schema. We also have monocentric Gaussians centered at the center of mass of the molecule. And uh, these monocentric Gaussians overlap with the polycentric Gaussians and go a little bit further. On top of that, we put uh, beast planes uh, starting at some point, what we call R0. And the key point here is that the polycentric Gaussians touch the beast planes, uh, the but the polycentric Gaussians don't overlap, don't touch with the beast planes. So we can neglect the integrals between polycentric Gaussians and beast planes. Here, you can see the performance of the gas basis for uh, 
a scattering state of the hydrogen atom. And you can see how the gas basis agrees really well with the analytical function. So depending on the integrals computed in the ISCHEM code, we can differentiate two parts. We have the quantum chemistry part that computes all the integrals between Gaussians and the scattering part when the B-splines are included. So now I'm going to pass to describe these two parts. First of all, the quantum chemistry part. In the ISCHEM code, there are different type of orbitals. We have polycentric orbitals. These orbitals are obtained at a quasi CF level. You can, and the ISCHEM code reads these all orbitals as an input. You can use any program you wanted, but then you have to transform the orbitals to the Molcast format. That is the format the ISCHEM code reads right now. Also, we have monocentric Gaussian orbitals. These monocentric Gaussian orbitals are created with an even tempered basis set of monocentric Gaussian functions centered on the, at the center of mass of the molecule. As I said, it's an even tempered basis set that is defined by a geometric progression. You can see here that these basis functions uh, are defined with R up to 2K plus L. So we have to, these two different values that we have to play with them when trying to do calculations. For instance, if we increase the K value, we will increase our radial extension the monocentric Gaussian will arrive further. And if we increase that, we will increase the angular flexibility. So imagine we have a big system and the polycentric Gaussian is a little bit far from the center of mass. Uh, we will have to increase our, we will have to put the B-splines a little bit further. And to be sure that the B-splines and the monocentric Gaussians are touching, we will have to increase the K value to increase the radial extension. Also, we have different kinds of states. We have source state that are the states computed with polycentric Gaussians. The typical source state are the ground state or excited states you wanted to include in the calculation. We also have the ionic state that are the parent ions included in the calculation. These parent ions are described as a linear combination of configuration state functions with a defined spin. And with a Google table obtained by Molcast, we transform them to linear combination of later determinants. So we can augment on every possible orbital. So we augment on each parent ion on every possible orbital, polycentric orbital and monocentric Gaussians. And then we transform back from later determinants to configuration state functions with another Google table obtained by Molcast. So at the end of the day, what we have at the end of the quantum chemistry part is all the one and two electron operators between all these states. The typical operators is overlap, Hamiltonian, dipoles, and whatever. So now in the scattering part, the first thing the scattering part does is to compute the missing integrals that are the integrals between Gaussians and B splines and between, and between B splines. Between the closed clapping approximation, the scattering states uh, are created by with the source states that are the ones defined with polycentric Gaussians and the augmented states. States augmented either in a monocentric Gaussian or in a B-spline. Here, you can see the schema of a typical matrix in the scattering part of the, quantum, of the scheme code. Uh, the, it could be the overlap, the Hamiltonian, or other operator. You can see here that all, all the integrals computed between Gaussians are computed in the quantum chemistry part I, I forgot to say that before, but the integrals, we obtained it from Molcas. It's Molcas who is, who is computing the integrals, and we obtained it from there. And we can see also here that the integrals between polycentric Gaussians and between Buist lines are neglected, are zero. We also see here the interference region between monocentric Gaussians and Buist lines. So these integrals are computed. And we see also here that where, when we just have Buist lines, we obtain a sparse structure. So now there are two ways to proceed. We can uh, fix, use fixed boundary conditions by imposing the wave function to be zero at the end of the box. And for example, by neglecting the last B-spline. And if we diagonalize the Hamiltonian, we will obtain a discrete spectrum. And if we transform uh, the different operators to, to the against stage of this Hamiltonian, we will have different matrices that are useful for propagate. So you, we can do uh, time-dependent propagation with these matrices. We include a complex absorbing potential. So 
during the propagation, when the photoelectron is arriving to the end of the box, it is absorbed, so we don't have reboundings. Also, we also have the scattering stage. There are several ways to compute the scattering stage. The most standard one right now is to compute them after the box eigen stage. And the scattering stage will be defined as a linear combination of different box eigen states. So the scattering stage, we can compute them as the, as the desired energies. And we also obtain the transitional dipole amplitudes. So with that, we can calculate the cross section, either in velocity or in length gauge. Sorry. OK, so now we have an idea of how the ASCAM code works. Now I'm going to briefly show some of the results the ASCAM code has produced in the last years. Uh, Marcus was focused mainly on the nitrogen molecule you see here. And uh, among other things he did on nitrogen, I'm showing here just uh, some of the results he obtained. In his calculation, he considered three different parent ions. And what I'm showing here is the cross section between the second and the third threshold that is full of reverse states, as you can see here, that is known as the Hopefield series. And we can see how the cross section obtained with this chem uh, really agrees with the experimental data obtained by synchrotron radiation. Something similar was done by Sonia with the oxygen. And uh, what we see here is the cross section for the continuum of this pi g parent ion. And we see how she's able, uh, the code is able to reproduce the, what is observed experimentally, especially in the presence of resonances. We see that the cross section agrees with experimental data. And we see here also here that the tendency is also well reproduced. Now, we are show, I'm showing the results of produced by Leon in the neon atom. It was the first time we consider excitation between continuum states in the, with the ischem code. So what he did was to reproduce a rabbit experiment uh, doing time-dependent propagation with the information obtained by the ischem code. And uh, the, in the experiment, they were exploring an energy, energy region where they were different resonances. So in this complex area, the ischem code was able to reproduce something very sensitive as the atomic phase for these two sidebands. And as you can see here, the agreement between the ischem code and the results and the experimental data is almost perfect. The ischem, uh, the ischem result is the black line you see here. So you can see how the ischem code is able to reproduce some, something very sensitive as the atomic phase. So we have seen how the ischem code is able to, to reproduce uh, different experiments, uh, what the ischem code is able to do. So we wanted to go one step further and we wanted to include the, the photoelectron angular distributions. So that was done during my internship in the University of Central Florida with the supervision of Luca Argenti, among other things we did. So we implemented the beta symmetry parameter and the molecular frame for electron angular distributions. So what is the beta symmetry parameter? But well, imagine we are in the laboratory frame and we know the direction of the laser polarization axis and we have our molecules randomly orientated. If we can detect the direction of ejection of the photoelectron, we can express the cross section depending on this angle theta. And we, you can see here the beta. So if the beta tends to two, it means that the preferred direction of ejection is almost parallel to the laser polarization axis. But if the beta tends to minus one, the preferred direction is almost perpendicular. I have to mention that the beta is always between minus one and two by definition. In contrast, the molecular frame photoelectron angular distribution, as the name says, it's in the molecular frame. So here, what we obtain is the direction of ejection of the photoelectron in respect to the molecule. So now I'm going to pass to show the results I obtained for the carbon monoxide that are still unpublished. Uh, why we chose carbon monoxide? But well, carbon monoxide is an heteronuclear molecule. So we expect to have a rich angular distribution. Also the feedback resonances in carbon monoxide hasn't been widely investigated yet. So we wanted to, to do it. 
And also, if you remember, in the first slide, I was talking about a rabbit experiment that they were able to detect this direction of photo ejection of the photoelectron. And that was done with carbon monoxide. So because of this reason, we chose to do it with carbon monoxide. So here you can see the parameters I used in the ACM calculation that I'm going to show here the results. We did different calculation, but we observed that at L equal four, we reached convergence. So as you can see here, I'm using a very big RAS. Uh, and we are trying, and we are including three different parent ions in the calculation. In fact, four because the pi is the generate. Uh, here you can see uh, from where the electron is leaving to to form these parent ions. I have to mention that this, that is just an approximation, a molecular orbital diagram with chemists chemists like to represent. But in fact, our wave function is multi configuration uh, is multi. It has more than one slater determinant. But you can see here that for the ground state, we have even more than 11 million of slate determinants. You can see here that the ionization energies obtained with the ischem code are the ones you see here, compared with the experimental ones are quite close. So with this RAS, we are able to reproduce well these ionization transitions. And uh, regarding the beach planes, we put the first beach plane at 8.7 atomic units and uh, our box is of 200 atomic units. So now I'm showing here the cross section obtained with the ischem code with this calculation in the energy region where there are experimental data. Uh, you, we are showing it in the velocity and in length gauge. We can see how we are able to describe the tendency. Uh, the, the match is not perfect, but we also have to have in mind that the ischem code is working better close to the thresholds when the kinetic energy of the photoelectron is low. In any case, uh, describing this, this cross section in this energy region is very difficult. Uh, as an example, I will show the results of different theoretical methods for the continuum of the first sigma, the first threshold. So you can see here how the other methods are also in the same trying to describe the experimental data almost in the same tendency as the ischem code, but any of them is matching perfectly the experimental data because it is really difficult. So we want to focus in the presence of resonances. Also, you see here that the ischem code is the only one, the only method who is reproducing these resonances here. And we want to focus in this area. So here you can see the cross section in this region you see here how the gauge invariance is quite good. And uh, for the first threshold, we observe that there are a lot of resonances. And the same for the second threshold. That's the red line is the, the continuum of the first sigma parent ion, and the green line is the continuum of the pi parent ion. So what we observe is that there are several resonances. And as we will see in the next slides, these resonances are going to change the photoelectron angular distributions. Now I'm showing the beta symmetry parameter uh, the same way as before in the energy region where there are experimental data. We see how our results match the experimental data, especially in the first and the second threshold, the red and the blue line. We also observe that the gauge invariance is also quite good. And uh, what we also observe is that in the presence of resonances, the the beta symmetry parameter is changing abruptly. If we focus in this region, we see what we were saying, that the resonances are changing the preferred direction of ejection of the photoelectron. For example, if you remember what we said before, when the beta was close to two, the preferred direction was almost parallel to the laser polarization axis. And when it was close to zero, uh, all the directions will, all, will have the same probability almost. So we see how resonances are changing this. For comparing the molecular frame photoelectron angular distributions, we compared our results with this reference. We have to thank here Robert Lucchese, who sent us the information of this paper to compare directly with our results. Uh, 
in this experiment they were trying to they were they were reproducing uh, they were able to detect the direction of the molecular axis in respect to the laser polarization axis but they, they were not able to know if the carbon was on one side or the other side so that's why we have a plane of symmetry uh, in that direction so what we are seeing here is the angle between the direction of ejection of the photoelectron and the angle between the laser polarization axis and we can see different things on one hand we are we see that the iskn code has a very good gauge invariance the velocity and length gauge results are almost identical we also see how our results are really close to the results obtained by in this paper by Lucese, and uh, the me method they were using is multi-channel swinger configuration interaction method that is a really accurate method so we can say that the ISCAN code is able to reproduce uh, the same results as this method that is really accurate and we also see how the mf patch the the direction of the photoelectron is changing with the kinetic energy of the of the photoelectron. Something similar we have when we consider the direction of polarization parallel to the molecular axis. As you can see, we we have almost the same conclusions as with in, in the last slide. Here we can see a little bit more differences, but different these differences are uh, when the kinetic energy of the electron is low. That is the part when the ischem code is working better. So probably we can have here some discrepancies, but as you can see, they are minimal, and the tendency is almost almost the same in both calculations. So now I wanted to to show the the MF patch in another way. Here in this schema, we see what we are seeing in the plot. We are just considering this plane, and we are varying this angle theta. The angle theta we see here is this angle theta in the plot. So we are seeing how the preferred direction of photo of ejection of the photoelectron is varying with the energy. For the case of the laser polarization perpendicular to the molecular axis. To guide the eye, I put here the partial cross section. Uh, and we see that in the non resonant part for the continuum of the first sigma state, sigma parention. We, said, we see that the preferred direction is almost parallel to the direction of the laser field, the laser polarization axis. But in the presence of resonances, this is completely changed. And uh, it is not changed always the same way. Depending on the resonance, the, the direction of protection will change. It could go towards the oxygen side or it could go towards the oxygen side. That depends. Something similar we can see in the continuum of the pi parention. Here, the preferred direction is also parallel to the laser polarization axis, but we can see also a little bit of contribution in the carbon side and in the oxygen side. And we also see how resonances are changing this preferred direction. For example, in this resonance, uh, the preferred direction is going towards the oxygen. Here, I'm showing something very similar, but now, with the laser polarization axis parallel to the molecular axis. Here we see in the case of the sigma uh, sigma parention that the preferred direction in the non-resonant part is almost towards the carbon, but the presence of resonances are again changing everything. For example, in this resonance, the preferred direction is moving towards the oxygen. It is very clear here. In the continuum of the pi parention, we have two preferred directions that are uh, 45 degrees and 135 degrees and also resonances are changing the preferred direction. So I'm going to show a movie of that that I can see I think is very illustrative. I'm going, okay, we'll put that here. So what we are seeing here is the same as before for the case of the laser polarization axis parallel to the molecule. Here we have the carbon and here we have the oxygen and we are going to see how varying the energy the net path is changing and we said before in the non resonant part here the preferred direction is towards the oxygen towards the carbon and we will see what happens we see how it's changing 
and in the top of the, that peak, in the top of the resonance, the preferred direction has moved towards the oxygen. So now I will just put the video and you will see how it's changing with the energy. When we will arrive to this area that is full of resonances, we will see how the MF path is changing very, very fast. Right? So we see how every time we reach a resonance, the photoelectron angular distribution is changing. So you see here how it changes very, very fast because it's full of resonances. And when there are no resonances, uh, it changes very softly. So we see every time how every time we reach a resonance, the the MF pad is changing. Okay, I think we have enough. I uh, will stop it. So we wanted to understand what this change when we are we reach a resonance was happening, and we focused on this resonance where we know that in the non-resonant part the preferred direction is towards the carbon, but in the in the presence of the resonance, the preferred direction moves towards the oxygen. So to try to understand what was happening here, we compute for the non-resonant part, the Dyson orbital between the ground state and the, the parent ion. The Dyson orbital tells us the information from where the photoelectron is leaving the system. So we see that the photoelectron is leaving the system mostly in the carbon side. So that will explain that why in the non-resonant part, the preferred direction is towards the carbon. For understand what was happening in the resonant part, we have to have in mind that a resonance is created by a metastable state embedded in the continuum. So we investigated this metastable state, and this metastable state was the pi parent ion with an electron in a very re re diffuse Rydberg orbital we see here. And we see here how this Rydberg orbital is a little bit uh, towards the oxygen. I don't know if you can appreciate it, but it is a little bit towards the oxygen. So that could explain that why, in the presence of the resonance, the preferred direction is towards the oxygen. So now I'm going to pass to describe briefly some of the results my colleague Pedro has produced with the piracin molecule. These results are still also unpublished. Uh, he has produced too, uh, too many results, but I'm just showing some of them because of the time. So here you see the piracin molecule. And here I'm showing the cross section of the piracin for the direction of polarization of X, X direction. And we see how we are able to see different resonances. So the thing is in the piracin, everything is more complicated. We have a lot of parent ions. In this here we are showing just four parent ions, but in the calculation, we are including five parent ions. So we see how uh, there are a lot of resonances and uh, we are just showing one direction in the other direction we have other things even more complicated and uh, we also compute the beta symmetry parameter and we see here that also the the presence of resonances is changing abruptly the the angular distribution we also see how the gauge invariance is quite good and uh, just it we also compute uh, different, you know, Pedro compute different molecular frame for the electron angular distributions. And we are going to focus first in this peak. In this peak, in this energy, we just have two different parent ions opened, these two thresholds. So we, we are showing here this, uh, the angular distribution and we see how it's really complex because of the, of the molecule, because of the complexity of the molecule. I also have to say that this calculation is for L equal nine. And we also investigated this peak, you see here, the one next to it, and we see something similar. The, the photoelectron angular distribution are very complex. So that's just a little bit of what Pedro did for the piracin. So now I'm going to pass to give some conclusions and future perspective. So we have seen how the ischem code works. 
on how they encode, is able to reproduce different experimental data. Also, remember you that this game code will be open source very soon, so probably you would like to use it. And uh, we have implemented photoelectron angular distributions. We have uh, compared our MF patch with the one of this reference, and we we have seen that they are as good as this multi-channel swinger configuration interaction method. And uh, we also have shown the results of carbon monoxide and pyrazine, and we have seen how the presence of feedback resonances are modifying this MF patch. For the near future, we would like to do time-dependent propagations. I say near future, but we are going to do it right now. We are we have everything prepared to start doing that. We would like to, for example, simulate rabbit experiments and to propagate uh, the photoelectron wave packet to the scattering state and to follow the photoelectron angular distributions. So to the end, I would like to thank all the people who started with the ISCHEM code, especially my PhD supervisors, Fernando and Jesus, and Luca Argenti for the nice time I spent with him in the University of Central Florida. Also, I would like to thank Marcus, Sonia, Leon, and Pedro for the results I've been showing in the in this presentation. And also I would like to thank Robert Lucese for sending us the information to compare directly our results with his results. And also I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm open to any question you have. Okay, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, Elke was uh, first, so Elke, please. Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, if you consider, um, well, of course, you first have to do your mole cost calculation, as far as I understand, but as soon as you have that, how computationally demanding are your simulations compared to the, initiate, uh, the initial mole cost simulation? Okay. Uh, I, I will answer the question without showing my slides because I don't know what happened, but you, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So it, it depends on the system and it depends on, on the, the size of the RAS. If you have a big RAS, it will be slower. It also depends a lot on the, on the angular momentum. If you, if you want to have a lot of angular momentum, you ha will have to compute a lot of integrals. So it depends. I could say that for the carbon monoxide I was showing with L equal four, in, I, I would say that in less than one week, you can have all the calculation done with uh, 10 nodes and with 16 processors node. But the, the time determining step, the rate determining step is then the MOCAS calculation or is it your simulation? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Well, you have two parts. You have the MOCAS calculation and you have your simulation. Yeah. Which one is more demanding? So it, it, it depends. It depends. Like if you imagine you, you want to have a really big, big box, you want to imagine a big a box of 1000 atomic units. In that case, it will be more expensive, the scattering part of the code that has to analyze all the Hamiltonian with all the B splines. And uh, so it completely depends on the system. Okay. In another way, if you have a big molecule that with a lot with a really big big, big RAS and you have a small box, it will be the opposite. It will be more expensive the quantum chemistry part than the scattering part. So it completely depends on the molecule. Okay, thank you. Okay, next uh, question, uh, Gilbert Grell. Okay. Okay. Um... I hope you can hear me. Yeah, thank yeah. you for the nice talk. Um, I was just wondering, you uh, actually you, you showed the cross sections for uh, oxygen and I think also for CO, and you mentioned that uh, it's difficult kind of uh, to describe the cross section in the medium energy region just over the resonances. Yeah. And in fact, there uh, you had some like. Uh, yeah, some some more pronounced disagreement maybe with experimental data. I think it was more visible in the oxygen case, actually. And the ox oxygen yeah, I was case, OK. Uh, I was wondering why uh, this is the case, because I would, like, frankly, naively, I would expect that a code like, like XM that is very... Uh, OK. 
So Very good, basically, yeah, here you can see it, uh, right? The discrepancy, like after just after the resonance is stopped, the cross sections are just just lower than the experimental data. And then later on, so yeah, starting from twenty seven EV, it catches up again. So, so the, the the thing is like the scan code is really taking into account a lot of electron correlation. So when the photoelectron is living with a low kinetic energy, the scan code is really well reproducing this situation, but as I said, we, have, we are using a gaps basis. So we have a part, we have a part where we just have a Gaussian. So the, the Gaussians have to describe a little bit the, the first the Gaussian then overlap with the B spline. So when we have a, kinet, a high kinetic energy of the photoelectron, the Gaussians can have a little bit of problems to reproducing these fast oscillations. So that's why when the kinetic energy of the photoelectron is a little bit high, we have a little bit worse results. Do you understand what I mean? Sorry, can you hear me? No, I think we lost, uh, I don't see him in the list of participants, so. Oh. Um, okay, so maybe you can uh, continue the discussion during the middle speaker session. Okay. Um, uh, I have just uh, two, two, two short questions, maybe. Yeah. Um, maybe I missed it, but uh, you do you compute the two electron integrals between the B-spline and the Gaussians, or it's only the one electron no, integral? No, no, just one electron integral. I, I will, it is here, yeah. No, we just Good. compute one electron integral between monocentric Gaussian and B-splines. We, all, okay, we only so. have one electron in the, in the B-splines and in the monocentric Gaussians. I see. Okay. And uh, you said that the code is going open source, uh, so I guess it relies on, on Molcas, but uh, are there other libraries? Uh, what language do you, I mean, it's it's a Python, Fortran, C, whatever. Just give us some some technical. Uh, sorry, you asked for the, for the open source, when it will be? Uh, no, no, uh, w what it relies on. So wh what kind of libraries we would need if we want to uh, use it? Is it just small cast and your code and uh, it's a yeah, self-consistent it, code or? Yeah, the, 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 op the open small cast is open source already. So you can also use it. So okay. you, you, won't, you won't need anything. You, you also need overcode and open small cast. And with that, you just have to install it and to use it. And okay. uh, it will be soon. We, we still don't know when because we are doing the paperwork right now. But yes. Okay, it's written in in uh, in, in which okay. language? In Fortran, but he has a it has an interface with Python three right now. Okay. It is. I also haven't said, but the scheme code is very user friendly. The input mm -hmm. files are really similar to the input files of Molcas, so it is really easy to use. If you are used to use quantum chemistry packages, it is really easy to use the scheme code. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rezus, if you have really short uh, question or comments. Just uh, yeah. referring to this, uh, the libraries that we are using are just the uh, standard MKL or LAPA or SCALAPA. Okay? So it's nice. not nothing fancy. Okay, and okay great. Also these libraries for the MOLCAS code, so in principle it's, it's fine. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. So. Okay, so let's thanks again, uh, Vincent, for the nice talk. And we'll move to the last uh, speaker for this morning. Uh, I see him now on the list. So it's Carl Michael Sims. I hope I, I didn't mess up his uh, name. Carl, are you, yep, can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, ah, yeah, okay. Uh, so can you share your, yeah, yep. perfect. Okay, I'll so share we're almost in time. And uh, so, okay. Um, well, I won't read the title. I guess you can uh, you can you can start now. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, thank you for the introduction, and thank you to the organizers for giving me the chance to speak here. Um, my name is Kamil Helsims. I'm a PhD student in the group of Stephanie Greff in Jena, and the title says I'm going to talk about quantum mechanical simulations of attersecond XUV ionization dynamics using um, atomic and molecular model systems. And I just want to start with a very, well, brief, brief recall from what we probably all know, what happens if we ionize um, a hydrogen atom or a, any simple system in a single active electron um, picture. 
what happens, like we have our XUV pulse and we have our ground state here. And if the energy provided by the XUV pulse is larger than the ionization potential, we will create a photoelectron in the continuum with uh, the energy given by this um, formula called the photoelectric effect or reflection principle, uh, however you like. And um, I refer to this now as a long pulse limit. We really have a long XUV pulse with a very short and well-defined um, spectral, spectral width. Uh, so the first question is, um, how accurate is this picture if you then go into um, after second pulses? Because that's obviously what you want to do, as my title suggests. And well, you can literature or just make a little calculation. And you will see, for example, if you look at the photoelectron spectrum for like a hydrogen-like atom, where we indicate again the one photon limit here with the dashed line, you will see two effects. First of all, if you decrease the pulse length, the very obvious effect is that the intensity decreases because the energy brought in the system is less. But what happens as well for after second pulses is that you shift your photoelectron spectrum away from the expected one photon dashed line towards um, low energies. And well, in the after second regime, this can be explained using this very simple picture to decompose our photoelectron spectrum in a transition dipole moment and the spectral intensity, like we know, for example, from SFA. And we know then for long pulses, like for five femtosecond pulses, we have a very well-defined um, spectral intensity around this dashed line with an almost not varying transition dipole moment which gives the spectrum then. And if we then slowly go into the after second regime and our um, pulse gets very broad in the spectral representation, what will happen ultimately that it's so broad that it basically more or less constant um, ranges over the um, energy um, range. And then our spectrum shifts more or less towards the transition dipole moment um, regime towards low energies. So uh, that's more or less a little um, introduction to our at a second um, XUV ionization in like one electron systems. And of course, we want to go beyond uh, one electron in the system. And in the literature, you can find a plethora of very interesting work on that, on many electron atoms. And I'm just going to reference two here. For example, the work from um, Michel Ivanov on helium atom and its after second dynamics governed by electron electron correlation. So what they showed is here the parent ion dynamics of the coherent wave packet. And what they discriminate are two time scales. So the so-called time scale, the instantaneous time scale during the XUV absorption, which they refer to as shake up and shake down processes. So this is the excitation. And this is the excitation of excited states beyond the ground state in the parent ion, which you see here, for example, in state two and state four, which are excited during the XUV pulse interaction and which obey the symmetry of the initial molecular um, atomic system. But you can also see, for example, state five, that there is dynamics happening long after the pulse has gone. And they refer to this as knock up and knock down processes. I introduce this here rather thoroughly because this is a language I'm going to use later as well. And of course, very famously, is this work, um, um, out of the, out of the second correlation dynamics paper, where they use the streaking technology to extract time delays and to characterize shake processes, so instantaneous processes, um, as shown here, experimental and, and theoretical work. OK, so. Um, We've seen that in literature, the atomic system, there's quite a lot of work around also for not just one single active electron, but also two and many body electron systems. And in general, um, shake up down processes are well known, knock up processes, then Oshie effect, as you heard uh, yesterday. And of course, um, very famously, ionization time delays, such as Wigner time delay, Coulomb, and streaking. So the question which arises now and which my talk is considering is what about molecules? So if you now go to multi-centered uh, systems to our molecules, um, how well do these um, properties we find in atoms hold for molecules? 
um, how is what what kind of effects arises because we have now differently bound electrons in strength and location and what's the role of electron nuclear correlation additionally to the electron correlation effects we know from atoms and can we somehow control this post ionization dynamic uh, this is uh, a rather wrong list i'm obviously not gonna address this all but i'm um, trying to introduce to you the model system we are using in, in quite thorough details it's a numerical um, based conference and i'm gonna briefly explain the atom second dynamics we see in this model system okay so the molecular model system we are using is the extensive genetic molecular model system we actually heard of it very briefly yesterday as well and it's shown here in this um, little picture and i just want to stress in the beginning we do this model system is um, designed to mimic differently bound valence electrons in arbitrary molecules it's not here to um, it's not um, meant to mimic a specific mole molecule it's just in general to try to get general applicable um, insight into ionization processes in molecules and for this I said we use this model system and it's comprised of five particles um, and they are all in a 1D real space. So all we are talking about is basically one dimension um, in, in, in real space. And we have these five particles on there on this one dimension, one dimensional world and the outer nuclei here and here, they are fixed. They don't move. They just come up in our Coulomb potential and the three inner particles are described uh, quantum mechanically um, exact and they are obviously about to move in their respective one dimension so we have this time independent hamiltonian describing this model system and as that we have two electronic and two nuclear degrees of freedom each in 1d real space on the right hand side you can see the corresponding potential and since we are in 1d real space we need to describe to describe ionization, meaning to leave the parent ion, uh, we obviously need um, soft or truncated Coulomb potential to allow for actual ionization process. That's shown here with arrow functions, and then we have parts for the nuclear repulsion. And between the outer and center nuclei, we have electron-nuclear interaction terms, and we have the electron-electron interaction term. What we can do. And what we do to kind of create an analogous picture known especially in the quantum chemistry world with potential energy surfaces, we create our initial wave function, our initial 3D wave function, by first of all obtaining adiabatic electronic eigenstates by solving this time independent Schrodinger equation in uh, two dimensions, relaxation methods, so two dimensions of the electrons and treating the nuclear parametric just for the initial wave function, just to have the concept of potential energy surfaces. If we do this, the potential energy surfaces are shown here. And then to have our initial 3D wave function, we just multiply our ground state adiabatic electronic eigenstate with a um, Gaussian um, to fit and to mimic the um, nuclear part of our 3D wave function. Okay, this is our model system we are using for the initial molecule. Now, obviously, if we ionize this model system, we'll, one electron will leave the system, and we have a parent ion system, which then has one electron less, and then it's described with one less electronic degree of freedom, with a here shown um, Hamiltonian and potential. And for this, again, we can solve it. We can solve the time independent shooting equation and obtain potential energy surfaces for our one electron parent ion. And now it's um, important to point out that this obviously uh, is not a quantum mechanical exact comic of what's happening in the parent ion because the electron can be on the left hand side. That would be its ground state, but it can obviously also be on the right hand side. So basically, this is the smallest model of a hole or electron migration, however you want to call it, or charge transfer. And um, we can see this if we look here at the adiabatic one electron eigenstates, um, and we look at the squared modulus of these of the wave function corresponding to these states, 
we see that in the ground and first excited state of the parent ion, the electron is located on the left-hand side, whereas for NS2, we have a charge transfer to the right-hand side. Okay, last but not least, um, we need a laser to have our Vindian XVB laser to have our ionization process. And we do this by a very short at a second pulse in velocity gauge and using the dipole approximation. And then, as said, we initialize our system. We have our very, very spectral broad pulse, which basically is able to excite all kinds of one electron and also double ionization states. And then we have a, our real time propagation using the three dimensional time dependent Schrodinger equation split operator on a grid using the here shown parameters. Okay, this was in, in, in broad detail how our model system works. Now let's have a look at what's happening when our when you propagate our time dependent Hamiltonian with the at a second XUB laser pulse. And we first start by looking at how what's happening to the electrons upon ionization. And for this, I show you here on the right hand side um, the integrate the density when we integrate out the nuclear degree of freedom. So we see where our two electrons are. And here we see what's already mentioned quite a few times uh, the recent uh, talks that electrons are indistinguishable. So we see that the X electron can be at negative values, meaning on the left hand side of our molecule and the Y electron at the same time on the right hand side. So here, but also vice versa, X can be at positive values on the right hand side, while Y is on and negative values on the left hand side. Just shows us the indistinguishability of electrons. Okay, so now let's our laser interact. Uh, and we see at two, one, two, and three femtoseconds, we see how the electron density evolves. And I won't just very briefly qualitatively discuss this here because it's a just nice visual picture. Because what we see here is that well, most of most of our two electrons stay bound, but there is a good portion of it where we see that one electron coordinate, for example, X, we see the electron moving towards long angle, higher position values, so it gets ionized and emitted out of the system, where the Y electron stays around plus minus five from the parent ion. And we have this in X forward, backward, and we have the same in Y direction forward, backward. Again, electrons you cannot distinguish. So this is fully mirror symmetric because we have nothing in our Hamiltonian that couples the two electronic degrees of freedom. We don't have anything like a spin orbit coupling in there. We also see that double ionization is, does not play a role here. Yeah, uh, so what can we say on a qualitative picture here already for our ionization dynamics? Well, we see, or you can believe me, that there is a forward backward asymmetry. And um, when we now look only at X, for example, I said it's sufficient to just look at one coordinate. We have this kind of double stripe structure. So this means that if we, if I, if the X electron gets emitted of our molecular model system, um, it's not like it gets emitted and the Y electron stays at one position, for example, here in the down channel, like left-hand side, we see that the Y electron can also be on the right-hand side. So there was a charge transfer or electron migration. And we can see that these processes have some substructures and we can also see that these things are happening on different time scales. Um, there are time delays mentioned here because here at three femtoseconds, we have uh, this down channel forward far more evolved than the up channel here. Okay, so we can already say that there will be some electron 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 nuclear correlation even, which are leading to different pathways during the ionization and not just our single active electron picture that one electron gets ionized and the rest stays and the parent ion electron stays in its original position. So what we are doing now, is um, we are using the fact that in the beginning I told you we are using the concept of potential energy surfaces to ease our um, analysis. And that's exactly what we are now doing. And this is very uh, in line with what I showed you in the introduction, what uh, Misha Ivanov is doing um, for the atomic systems. So 
So I said, with our XUV pulse, we ionize basically a bunch of one electron parent ion states. And now we want to have a look at how these states are populated during the XUV at a second ionization. And we do this by taking our full wave function, our full three-dimensional wave function, and by projecting out the bound to electron part, so this down here. And then we project this wave function, which we can say so the parent ion plus continuum wave function. We project this on our one electron basis, which we calculated before. And then we can see how these one electron states are populated during the XUV interaction. And what we see here is very similar to what we've seen in atoms. So we see that we have, first of all, excited states are populated, meaning we are not just left in the um, lowest uh, ground state of the parent ion. And you can see that we have these two time scales shows seen in atoms as well. So we have an instantaneous, we have instantaneous uh, population of excited states, but we have also pronounced dynamics when also when the um, XUV pulse is already vanished. That's shown here. And what our next step is now, um, we try now, well, let's run up. It's, it's nice to see that we have shake up and knock up and that we have correlation effects, but now we try to dissect this into specific ionization pathways and try to understand why do we have these different pathways and can you maybe relate this to some more intuitive semi-classical pictures. Okay, uh, to do this, um, we need some, uh, we need some little uh, theoretical tricks. And for this, first of all, we come back to what I said initially. Um, we have the quantum, me quantum mechanics has the principle that electrons not distinguishable, but it's uh, in this case, it's a problem. For the analysis, if you for example want to say where the emitted electron is coming from, we can't say this, it could come from X or Y electron, it could come from the right or left hand position. So the first trick and approximation we are doing is, that we're using artificial subsystems, as we call it, meaning that this is our full initial density, electronic density. And now we just make our electrons distinguishable by applying a heavy side function around the mirror plane and creating a subsystem, let's say A and B, in which we can exactly say where which electron lays. For example, subsystem A means that the X electron is on the left-hand side, the Y electron is on the right-hand side. The X is a strong and the Y the weakly bound electron. And um, um, later, when we look in the ionization processes, we always monitor the X electron. So uh, if only looking at the X electron coordinate, we can exactly say where it comes from and which, where the Y electron stays in the parent ion. And our second approximation is to use a restricted field interaction meaning we let our XUV pulse only interact with one of these electrons. So in the end, we have four calculations basically in the subsystem AB and each of them only letting interact with the X or the Y electron to um, differentiate different pathways leading to ionization. Okay, and as I said, we are now only looking what's happening in X direction and forward, backward direction uh, for X ionization single ionization forward and backward direction using these two systems, uh, these two approximations. Okay, so what I show here, this is the full result, the full system, full interaction, meaning none of these two approximations I just introduced, and this in forward and backward direction, and here we see the dynamics, we see the population of the um, parent ion states, ground state, first, second excited states. And now, as said, um, we do this for our artificial subsystem and restricted field. And I'm fully aware that this is a rather a tedious uh, um, slide. So there's no need to get confused. I try to uh, walk you through this uh, slide slowly one by one. I'm just gonna point out at this point, the general organization of this slide which is that this A and B indicate which subsystem we use. So for example, A meaning X is there, Y is there. And here we indicate um, with which electron the laser interacted. Meaning here, the laser interacts with the X electron, which is the electron which gets ionized. 
and the, here with the y electron, the laser interacted with the electron, which stays in the parent ion, and is not ionized. Okay, and again, as a reminder, interesting to watch out for the NS2 state, because this one is on the right-hand side, where is zero and one is on the left-hand side for the parent ion. Okay, we start now with this panel F. So we ignore everything else and just look at panel F. Panel F is a calculation in the B subsystem, meaning the Y electron is on the left side, the X electron is on the right-hand side. And we also interact the laser with the X electron and we also monitor the X electron getting ionized. Um, and what we see here in the quantum mechanical um, population of the parent ion state, we see that just the ground state and is not is populated in the parent ion, and there's no other dynamics really going on. And this is explainable with, as I said, this little comic semi-classical picture that the X electron just gets ejected, emitted out of our ionized out of our molecular system, and the Y electron didn't interact during this process and it just stays on the left hand side. So that's why we frame this uh, a direct emission. And the same thing can happen on the left towards the backward direction. And this is our, the panel C here. This means uh, the X electron interacts with the laser pulse, it's emitted in the left to the backward direction, did not interact with the Y electron. The Y electron just stays on its initial position, which is the NS2 state, if you remember, on the right hand side. Um, then we have panel D and E, where again, the X electron here, for example, gets out of the system, but it will have to interact with the Y electron during its ionization. So the X electron will pass the Y electron. And well, first of all, what you see here initially is that the X electron, if it just leaves the system, the Y electron, the parent ion will stay on the right hand side, which is the NS2 state. That's what we see in the quantum mechanical results. But as you can already see, there is more dynamics going on. We see here, which we call a knock down process, meaning that the Y electron will at some point will take the place of the X electron and we'll have a charge transfer. And the same thing will happen in the left-hand side on the, on the backward direction. And the X electron, if it gets emitted, it will interact with the Y electron. Um, and then we have basically two quantum mechanical results. Number one, the Y electron does not really care about the X electron passing it, or there will be an energy exchange and the Y electron, the parent ion, will be left in an excited state. Here, the NS1 state. Yes, and this will be again a knock up, whereas we saw here the knock down process, which can also happen in this emission where the Y electron takes the place of the, left, of the X electron. These four panels, these four pathways were all for the fact that the electron that gets emitted is the electron who absorbed the XUV pulse. But in theory, uh, when what's happening, um, it can also be the other way around. And that's what we make here. It's where the Y electron, we let the XUV pulse interact with the Y electron, but nonetheless, we monitor that the X electron gets ejected. And that's exactly what we see here. So what we see in the, quant in the um, quantum mechanical results is that the X electron um, gets emitted and the parent ion gets populated in its ground state. And this can be understood like a, like a game of, of pool or billiard. In a very classical picture, the Y electron absorbs the XUV pulse, gets ionized, it, it scatters, it um, interacts in the, in elastically with the X electron, and the X electron then leaves the actual molecular system, and the Y electron takes the place of the X electron in its ground state, or again, excited with energy exchange in an excited state. And this can happen in both directions. Okay, so I think we, we made it through this slide and uh, show that there are different ways we can understand in a, in a semi-classical picture what happens during the after second ionization uh, in molecules. And now, of course, uh, in, in this community, uh, uh, time delays are always uh, very interesting. And so we want to report on this as well. As you might imagine, it is rather tricky to extract absolute time delays in this multi-centered, highly Coulombic system. So we don't do it for now, um, but we can do reference time delays. We basically reference to the, the fastest process 
which is the direct emission of the weakly bound electron. And then we see that the direct emission of the stronger bound electron is 20 attoseconds delayed, which is rather expected. And we can also see that then the, uh, the emission where the X and Y electron interact is even further delayed. And the inelastic emission where we have this billiard pool-like picture um, is actually uh, um, quite a lot delayed. And the same thing can happen in the other direction. Okay, so I've talked now extensively about the electron dynamics, um, but I'm sure some of you already realized um, that we have more features in here because as said, the, um, the nuclei is also treated quite mechanically. And we see here this behavior in the post ionization dynamics. And this is uh, very well known in the, in the field quantum mechanics uh, in quantum chemistry. Here we have uh, avoided crossing in our parent ion. And this transition here is exactly that our wave packet in the, on the nuclear wave packet in this case in our parent ion will have evolved after let's see, 15 femtoseconds towards the avoided crossing. And we will have here a transition between the two states. This can also be seen if you look into the parent ion density, that's the electron, the nuclear density. We see how the nuclei moves to the right hand side. And then here, about 50 femtoseconds, we see a split in the electron density. And that's because, um, as we still remember, the N is two states on the right hand side, the N is one state on the left hand side. So this is actually a non anapetic transition, which, are charged, which um, induces a charge transfer. Okay, so let's have a look at the time. Okay, we're good in time. Um, so what I showed you is uh, our simple molecular model system, which we use to try to mimic single photon, single XCV ionization in an arbitrary molecule with valence electron. And we used uh, some artificial subsystem in a restricted field interaction to try to relate to semi-classical picture and to discriminate different pathways, which we named uh, the following in direct scattered and indirect emissions. We saw that we have pronounced shake and knock processes and that we have time delays um, in these different pathways. Uh, so what we can say in general is that the post ionization in such a, a molecule is interestingly driven by co coherent electronic and a nuclear waste packet in our parent ion, as we have seen for this um, non anapetic transition. Okay, so what is next? We now have this uh, model system, and now we obviously want to uh, understand and control um, more different situation simulations uh, to understand in more detail, especially the role also of the nuclei. And as mentioned before, one thing would be to have uh, absolute time delays. That's something which we have to work on. And another step now is how can we control how we, depending on the pulse length and also on our wavelength, uh, how will our electron electron correlation to process change? And we want to have, since we now have this very exact with TDSE, we'd want to do some method comparison with that as well. And we have a few more minutes left. I just want to very briefly go in a slight more detail of what we are planning to do here and what we already did here in our in a, regarding a method comparison and um, how we want to look into the control in the continuum. Um, as you might imagine, this uh, lengthy uh, analysis, which took me here 30 minutes to present, is uh, would be rather tedious to do every time and not, not nicely to, to really grasp um, if you want to do this for every parameter set. So what we are using now in the future is the forward-backward asymmetry as a kind of correlation indicator because the forward-backward symmetry arises because the two different bound electrons use different pathways and they are differently pronounced. And they are all due to electron-electron correlation. So we will from now on always use this forward-backward asymmetry in a way to understand our correlation. And then we did basically the same analysis with different methods uh, our TDFE, perturbation theory, Hartree Fock, time dependent Hartree Fock. Um, and what we basically see there is that only TDSE uh, or exact perturbation well, or um, 2D perturbation theory are really able to 
reproduce our asymmetries, which we see um, through a different um, range of pulses, and that uh, Hartree Fock, as expected, but also time, time dependent Hartree Fock, are not able to reproduce our uh, correlation effects. And, well, let me do some more about trying to understand how continuum resonances relay on the relay on pulse length and wavelength, but this is something for a, for a different talk. Um, or I'm happy to talk about this or discuss this in the meet the speaker session. So um, now the things we want to do then is to look more in the nuclear electronic coupling during ionization, since we have our quantum mechanically treated uh, nuclei, we can look into electron decoherence, spin effects, of course, and then um, into the relation to real molecules. So I want to finish with uh, thanking you for your attention. And I um, want to thank uh, Professor Dr. Stephanie Gräfe for the topic uh, in her group, and Dr. Alexander Schubert, and uh, Jakob Runke, who is a bachelor's student doing a research project with me on the nuclear electron coupling during um, ionization. Uh, thank you very much, and I am looking forward to any questions. Okay, thank you for uh, the presentation. Um, so now we have uh, some time for questions. So please raise your hand if you have questions. I'm trying to see uh, some... Uh, I don't see any hands now for now, so I'll, I'll ask the first question. Um, so uh, towards the end, you show, I mean, you compared a different uh, method and you show that you, you need to do full correlation and so on to get uh, this asymmetry uh, right. But what if you do time dependent CIS, if you just include single excitation? Because, I, I, I mean, it went a bit fast for me, but in the list, it was mostly a uh, heart effect, right? Or some perturbation. But if you do only singles, which uh, should be not too uh, expensive. How would that be? So yeah, in principle, I mean, um, we can try any kind of theory on that. That was just basically the first uh, idea. Um, because you can easily do like a numerically um, exact hard fog on there and create two um, orbitals or one electron wave functions and then do that also time dependent. Um, I'll have in mind, I'm not sure how to how easy to do CIS on this, but uh, uh, I'll, definitely something I can I can I can think about. Okay, okay, but just so yeah, you don't know if you you really need the the, the two electron uh, uh, correlation if uh, to get this right. Okay, mm. are there questions? Mm. No, I don't see any other questions. So maybe we can, uh, we still have time, so we can wait uh, one or two uh, minutes to see if questions come up. Uh, just maybe I can answer to uh, Gilbert for the, yeah, we saw that you disappeared and uh, we thought that maybe you can ask your question to Vincent during the uh, middle speaker uh, session that you uh, would just uh, follow, okay?